Earlier, I spoke with Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, former National Security Advisor to U.S. President Jimmy Carter. He is also a counselor and trustee at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a foreign policy think tank based in Washington, D.C. I began by asking Dr. Brzezinski about the significance of Vice President Xi's visit. Let me start by asking you about the uh, Chinese Vice President's visit. I know that you had a chance, uh, from what I understand, to get to meet him. Uh, what was your takeaway? I had a chance to have a decent conversation with him because I sat on his right at the dinner, so we could talk to each other. He struck me as intelligent, informed, cautious, typical of a vice president in waiting. I met him a couple of times earlier in China, so this was not a surprise to me. You, I think, uh, from what I understand, uh, were somewhat critical of uh, the president and vice president, how they uh, brought up some of these, addressed some of these thorny issues in public. Uh, do you think that's just not the right venue? What was your thought on that? Well, my sense is that the relationship between America and China is both important and delicate. It's important because we can both benefit if it works out well, and we'll both lose if it does not. Um, but it's also delicate in the sense that on both sides there are some anxieties, there are some suspicions, on our side anxieties about their taking advantage of us economically, on their side some suspicions that we're trying to gang up on them or organize some sort of a coalition against them. And in that setting what we could see, if we're not careful, is an escalating tendency towards reciprocal demonization. We'll be demonizing them, they'll be demonizing us, and then the question arises, where are we headed? And the answer? Well, the answer is obviously not very good, so I don't even need to make it. The point is, it's a trend which should be counteracted to the extent that it is possible to do intelligently, and it is something that on both sides we have to handle with some sense of personal delicacy. I just felt a little uncomfortable that a guest who was being greeted here as the next president of China had to stand in front of a large audience for quite a long time to listen to a welcoming address in which at the same time his country and his administration potentially in the future, his presidency in a way, by implication, uh, were being, well, shall we put it mildly, examined uh, with some degree of uh, hesitation as to the propriety of some aspects of their conduct. Well, let me talk a little bit about your book, Strategic Vision, because you kind of get at the heart of the fact that uh, Americans really aren't as learned as they should be about foreign policy. And I think some of the things that we've been seeing in this election year, uh, obviously the Chinese are not going to the polls in November. So it's easy to throw uh, you know, brickbacks at, at the Chinese. Uh, we've seen it on the Republican side. Uh, President Obama himself in the State of the Union kind of called out China. Does this kind of add to this, uh, what you're describing here in terms of the demonizing? Well, what you have just described is essentially a tendency towards public pandering, pandering to basic feelings, emotions, anxieties. It's also perhaps a way of uh, justifying certain internal inadequacies. Maybe we could have done some things better, but it would take a lot of effort to make it better. So it's easier then to point to someone outside and say, well, we're not doing better because of them. Um, and that's related to the more general condition, which is, I think, to me at least, quite seriously worrisome, namely that the American public is basically ignorant about the world. It doesn't get the news. Who does get the news? There are no major newspapers that most Americans read. There's only three or four major newspapers in America that cover the news. The rest doesn't. So you don't get it mostly from the newspapers. Television, the evening news, so-called, it's probably 45 seconds of some international event, hopefully, preferably, if it's kind of striking, huge catastrophe of some sort, but nothing kind of more searching. Beyond that, human interest stories. And then what else do Americans watch? Entertainment, sports, 
competitive games on television, some sexual play, or whatever. But none of it deals with the world. The American public at the same time recently had a shocking experience, a terrorist attack. So it's also a little bit shaken and anxious. All of that cumulatively makes the public more prone to demagogy or to simplistic explanations of what is happening in the world. And that as a feedback then dictates the position that the leaders have to take. And that I think is worrisome. We see this right now, and I'll end on this, in the escalation of anxiety over the possibility of a conflict with Iran. Does the United States really need a conflict with Iran? Are we really being threatened by Iran? Can't we handle it intelligently and put a little bit of a damper on the pressures for war? You can't do it very easily if the public is not informed. If you uh, uh, were to advise uh, President Obama on, on how to uh, lessen some of the tension with China, what, what might you suggest to him? Well, what I would suggest is that, first of all, we reiterate as much as we can the kind of joint agreements we already have and the communique issued a year ago or so by President Obama and President Hu Jintao provides the perfect framework for that. And that needs to be reiterated, and people need to be reminded, and it has to be a standard by which to judge the evolution of the relationship. But secondly, to the extent possible, try also to engage in some fashion on a periodic basis in acts of public education involving, let's say, in this particular case, we're talking about China, uh, maybe even in collusion with the leadership from the other side, some joint speeches or some well-timed events that interact on the presidential level so that in both countries there is this process. I mean, I don't think we should be simply uh, accommodating to anything the Chinese do because some things they do we don't really like. You talk about, uh, in your book, the peaceful rise. Uh, you do the comparison of China with uh, the Soviet Union, and yet there still are a lot of people who are alarmed at the uh, expansion of the military on the Chinese side. Uh, is, you know, and there's this, you know, the rumblings that there may be another Cold War. You, you just don't see that. Well, I don't see that as something inevitable. I see it as something possible, as a byproduct of the kind of things we're talking about. But I think it is certainly avoidable. Let me ask you about the Pacific pivot. Is this a, a miscalculation on the part of the administration? Does this intensify? No, I don't, the... I don't consider it a miscalculation. I think it underlies, underlines a perfectly legitimate proposition that the United States is a Pacific power with some, indeed, Pacific Ocean alliances in the Far East. It doesn't mean that the United States has to be involved in conflicts in the mainland. It doesn't say that. It doesn't have to unless it's rather short-sighted in so far as the likely consequences of such conflicts for us otherwise would be. But I think it was a mistake to present it publicly as involving somehow or other a military shift as we disengage from Southwest Asia and therefore we were shifting to the Far East. I think that was a mistake. And it was made to look a little bo both provocative and ludicrous by the fact that in that context there was this pumped up announcement that we're going to be deploying 500 Marines in Australia as part of this so-called pivot. And the question obviously arises, is Papua New Guinea about to threaten Australia? Could it be Indonesia, which is not far away? Or is it really China? I mean, it just, I thought it was a pointless uh, reference to what otherwise is a perfectly sensible step. The Australians are a friend of ours, they're good soldiers, let's have joint maneuvers, why not?